From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. This week on Newsmakers, a debate between the two candidates running for mayor of Attleboro. Incumbent Kevin Dumas was first elected in 2003 as the youngest mayor in city history. Prior to that, he worked in the financial services sector. Challenger Paul Haro is a Massachusetts state representative elected in 2012. Prior to that, he was the director of research and planning at the Department of Corrections. Who will lead the region's ninth largest city? This week, Dumas, Huro, debate the issues on Newsmakers. Welcome to this special edition of Newsmakers. I will be moderating this debate and asking questions along with my colleague, WPRI.com reporter, Ted Nisi. Mr. Dumas, Mr. Huro, thank you for accepting our invitation. There is no strict format to this debate. We are looking for an open and honest discussion of the issues. But if we feel like you're not answering the questions or you're taking too long, we will jump in. Now to begin, each candidate has a one minute opening statement, the order of which was drawn randomly prior to this debate. Mr. Dumas, you go first, your one minute opening statement. Thank you very much and thanks for having both of us today. It's been an honor and privilege serving the city of Attleboro for the past 14 years. I was elected as the youngest mayor in Massachusetts at the time at the age of 27. Um, of course now I'm 41 going on 42 and to be able to serve in this capacity has been truly an honor and a privilege. And to be able to take Attleboro for what it was at that time, um, virtually on the, the verge of bankruptcy, and to see where we are today in financial surpluses, building on our reserves of now almost $4 million in the city stabilization fund, but truly making all strides uh, across the city, whether it be our goals for education, our goals in public safety, our goals in our park and recreational programs, and to see where the city is today, it's virtually we've changed the city of Attleboro and the face of Attleboro, and the services that we provide to 43,500 people um, it's a vast variety of services that we provide, of course, but literally touch people in a very different way. Um, and we're very proud to be able to do that. And we have a great team that provides those services to the public. Thank you, Mr. Dumas. Now, Mr. Varro, your one minute opening statement. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting us on. And um, I'm having a great time this election season, and I'm running to uh, take the city even further than it, we've already come along. Uh, the mayor has a lot of good projects going on, but there's a lot of things that we could be doing different uh, that we're not currently doing. You know, we don't have a good relationship as a city with the local chamber of commerce, which has a great pulse on the community. We lost 30 teachers last year because of uh, budget problems that have been building up for years within our school department. We also lost a lot of, uh, you know, city employees, and so there's a lot of things, you know, that Attleboro has good going on, but there's also a lot of things that we could be doing better. And you know, I've uh, laid out uh, you know different things I want to do to improve the business climate. I've laid out a plan uh, that you know would uh, help increase uh, education financing, as well as improve city governance. You know, things like establishing term limits and putting our city checkbook online, and creating a disability rights commission. All right, Mr. Hurl, thank you very much. Let's dive into the questions, and I want to start with uh, Attleboro High School. This is a big issue in your city. Uh, both of you support the construction of a new uh, high school in Attleboro at the cost of about $265 million. Estimates are city taxpayers will have to pay about half of that with the state picking up the rest of the tab. But the project will require voter approval for a tax increase in 2018. Mr. Dumas, you said in, your in a previous debate there is no plan B. Is it responsible to not consider an alternative plan in case voters reject the override when you have laid out a situation that is dire for the current school? Sure. I'd like to be able to explain why there isn't a plan B. And the reason is because if there were other improvements that are made to the school, whether it's electrical, plumbing, um, HVAC, and all the related technology upgrades that are required for that building, if those things are done, we trip that building coming up to full handicap accessibility and full building code requirements. Which you'll have to do if the override doesn't pass. But that's something that the city could not afford. Um, so that would be my, mainly on all city taxpayer dollars. So instead of being approximately 130 million, it would be almost 200 million on the city's dime. So that's something that the city would not be able to do. Why not propose a pared down school or a, a cheaper school that might be more palatable to voters? Sure. That when we go through the process, the school building committee and working with the Mass School Building Authority, they make you make sure that the building that you're providing as the design and for construction pairs to the educational plan that's required. So per the school's educational plan, this isn't a Taj Mahal. This is the bare bones of what's required to provide 21st century education per ed plan to our students. So it's all or nothing? Yes. All right. Mr. Haro, uh, you have criticized your opponent for not uh, discussing alternatives. 
but by floating the idea of a smaller school or a less expensive one, are you undercutting its chances in 2018? Uh, I hope not. And I would say it's a mischaracterization that I've criticized uh, the mayor for not talking about alternatives, uh, because what he says is right in that you know this current proposal is the only proposal we have on the table right now, and what we do need, we, the sooner we get this new school, the better off we are. Um, you know, I made a comment the other day that you know I would work to triage exist like you know immediate needs, and I'm talking about a, do a door falling off the hinges, stuff like that. But I've met with the MSBA. I've confirmed what's been uh, talked about with the uh, you know school building authority and you know in, within the city. Um, you know, you know if if we are in, you know in a place where the current um, plan fails, the city is going to be in a lot of trouble. So what we need to do is, you know, work together to make sure that the current proposal passes. Um, you know, I think that, you know, it, there's a chance it could fail, but, you know, in, as, as far as you can tell right now, it would be much better if we just work together to see that this current proposal passes. Do you think you should have an alternative plan waiting in the wings in case uh, as we get closer, as you get closer to 2018, it's looking pretty grim? Um, an alternate plan would cost money and it would also require that we come up with a new educational plan because the uh, current proposal is based on the educational plan that the school committee created so it would involve several steps and it would, I mean the current plan was also you know cost over a million dollars to uh, hire an architect firm to um, you know create the current you know kind of rough designs and so that that would push the whole process back quite a bit so it, you know it is something we should definitely be cognizant of um, we should also be mindful of the voters who are paying for this and the challenges they would face if they did you know experience what's been called an on average a four hundred dollar um, tax hike you know it's, it's about hundred forty dollars per hundred thousand um, so that's something we have to be mindful of as voters who pay for the bill okay thank you Ted Voters have trusted both of you repeatedly with important jobs, the ones that you, you currently hold. I think I read in the Sun Chronicle that neither one of you has ever lost an election. So let's, let's reflect for the voters for a minute, and I'll start with you, Mr. Harrow. What do you consider the biggest mistake you've made as a state representative? Oh gosh, biggest mistake. Um, I've, made, I've made several. I mean, it, it comes with any job. I mean, you know, you, you, there's always a learning curve. I think one of the... Um, you know, embarrassing things that I, uh, you know, first did was I signed on to a bill. It was about, it was I was on the job for about two or three weeks, and I signed on to the bill. It was uh, a bill that was about civil rights, and it was involving, uh, you know, firing police officers who engage in egregious racial violate, you know, uh, racial discrimination, and you know, w there was a list of criteria of what would constitute that racial, you know, uh, like an you know, egregious civil rights violation. One of the things was swearing, but not exclusively. So I got dubbed as a person who was, uh, you know, wanted to fire police officers for swearing. And that's just not the case. That was one of many. And, and, you know, and so that What did was, you learn from that then? What did I learn from that? Um, we, what, actually, what I've done, that's a really good question. What I've done ever since then, anything concerning police, every single time I contact the police chief and I ask him, what are your thoughts about this? What do you, you know, how would you like me to vote on that? You know, so I, I've done that over and over again. And I was much to my surprise, he actually uh, responded in an email once. He said, you're the only, you know, uh, person in the state delegation, the two state senators and the two state reps, that contacts me as much as you do about this, you know, the different things. So it was a, um, you know, it was, uh, the, the optics of that bill looked really bad. And, you know, my predecessor had also uh, co-sponsored the same bill. He it never came up in the news with him. Uh, but, th you know, that, that was a good one where, you know, I, it was only, the bill was two paragraphs long and, you know, I read the bill. But my interpretation was quite different than the police chief's. But ever since then, I've worked with him very closely on things, you know, and asked him, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? All right, Mr. Dumas, same question to you. What do you consider the biggest mistake you've made since you've been mayor? And what did you learn from it? No, thanks a lot, Ted. It's actually a really good question. And, you know, going back and reflecting upon 14 years and looking back at your whole career uh, in this position certainly provides a lot of opportunity to say, you know, what, what could have I done better? And I think one of the things specifically reflecting on this, this election in this campaign is the fact to say, you know, taking the job very seriously, it's a 24-7 job. Um, you're always on the go, and the phone's ready to ring 24-7, and you're the person that's ultimately responsible for any action or any problem or any issue in the city. And I think a lot of times that I've found, not only on the campaign trail, but talking with people, people aren't aware of some of the things that we're doing. Or quite a few of the things sometimes. We're actually going door to door and talking with individual people in, in their places, whether it be at a nursing home or an old age facility or you're going door to door, you find out the fact people aren't aware. 
So I think that we've fallen short as the city, and, and me personally, as a way to how do we get the message out there better about what we're doing? Because we're doing these services and actually providing these things for the general public. So whether or not you're a registered voter or not, I think I've fallen short on getting the message out of the things that we're doing for the benefit of the people and the reason why the city staff is so dedicated in pouring these services out to the public. And, and we need to find a better way to do that. I don't have that, that plan now, but I can tell you that whether it's social media or whether it's the fact of doing more outreach, direct outreach, community groups, um, we need to do a, a better job and specifically for me to be able to get that message out there. This is a lot to be proud of. All right, Mr. Dumas, we're going to stick with you. Earlier this month, you released a comprehensive five-year plan to address school financing. This is a major issue in your city. Last year, in fact, uh, there was layoffs of nearly three dozen school employees. I'm wondering why it took you 14 years in office and just weeks before Election Day to address this matter. Sure. So specifically, when we talked about this uh, a few weeks ago, we've been working on this plan for over a year, close to 18 months, to be able to go through and collectively bring together a comprehensive plan with both the city and the school. So while the plan addresses specifically school dollars and to be able to fill the needs gap of approximately where it stands today, about $9.3 million for their goals, um, this also addresses the, the city's sustainability and the city's goals. But this is something that we've actively talked about all the time. And so back in 2011, it actually started. The city provided its first million dollars over the state minimum requirement. And that was with the city taking action because the Chapter 70 formula certainly wasn't providing an increase that was terribly needed. I think it was about approximately only $150,000 in additional state aid that was coming to Attleboro at that time. So we enacted the meals tax, which provided a million then. So this wasn't something that we just started just a a year ago. This is actually something we started back in 2011 and of course now in 2017. Um, and working together to be able to provide the appropriate details for all city departments. So it wasn't just the schools, but of course the schools has the largest portion A of the city budget and receives chapter 70 dollars which are determined by the state and not the city. So collectively we've been able to put this plan together and it, um, to be able to address the needs today. Did it take the forward. layoffs uh, tr uh, to trigger you to work on a five-year plan, a comprehensive plan? It was this major issue on Chapter 70 reform that was needed that really triggered the discussion. All right, Mr. Hero, uh, while some can be uh, critical of the mayor for his timing, others can say at least he has analyzed the issue and he has a comprehensive plan. Where's your white paper? Well, I've identified several things that we're going to do differently, um, you know, in terms of education financing and where we would get the money. I mean, I've, I've put these things, you know, uh, forward in the last debate. You know, the, um, you're using recreational marijuana industry. You know, that's between one and three million dollars a year. Is that a really reliable source of revenue to rely on pot money to fund education? Um, I don't see why it wouldn't be. I mean, it's it's, a, it's most industries that start Is it predictable? off. Is it predictable? Um, that's based on the estimates that you know are you know are coming out of the mayor's office right now. One of the things that I like about this you know particular form of revenue is that it w you know by using it, it's a new revenue, it wouldn't have to take away from any other um, city departments, and so that's one place we could get it. There's b I identified there's a lot of lawsuits that can easily be av uh, avoided as another place. Um, How much money would that save? One city councilor has estimated that we've lost about $10 million in lawsuits over the last several years. I identified a couple of them, um, you know, the other night. Uh, but these are lawsuits that are happening largely because of personality clashes, not because of routine, um, you know, administrative issues. Uh, you know, so the the plan that was outlined, the five-year plan. Um, that was outlined by the uh, mayor, and you know that was definitely a political document. I mean, it's there were several problems with that. It's based on contract negotiations, you know, that are requiring city employees to take a uh, reduction in their health care contribution from 75 percent to 60 percent. I've spoken with several unions; they will not go for that. You know, I you may, uh, Mr. That's Dumas, just one thing of many. Mr. Dumas, I want to uh, give you a chance to respond to that. Uh, he calls it a political document. Uh, and says you're calling for an increase in health care costs for, for teachers. How do you respond? So there are many aspects to this document and first and foremost something that is tangible of recurring dollars. Starting in fiscal 19, not only do we keep the million over the minimum, again it continues with 50 percent of the increase in the tax levy, which is about 1.6 million, 1.7 million, so over half of that goes to the in increase. An additional $750,000 
above that as well, and that's coming from retired school debt from one of our middle school projects that's coming offline. We dedicated that specific revenue to this plan. And the other aspects of the plan that are very important also talk about not only future changes to employee benefits, and unlike Mr. Haro, what he just said, this is important to note, the 60-40 split would only be for new employees, not for existing school and city employees. Very briefly. Um, that's something that the unions have said they will not go for. They won't have a uh, two-tiered uh, uh, health care split. They, it's dead on arrival. We yeah. just secured our first union yesterday, sir. All right, uh, Ted. Mr. Hurl, I'll stick uh, with you on this one. Um, I want to ask you both about pensions. It can be a dry mm -hmm. issue, but an important issue for city finances. Um, your campaign literature uh, said on one that I saw on Facebook, mm -hmm. quote, it is critical that city employee retirees get a modest COLA, which is a mm -hmm. cost of living adjustment, mm -hmm. on a regular basis. The city's latest audit shows it has a roughly $68 million pension shortfall already. Mm -hmm. How much more would your proposal on the COLA add to that shortfall? Well, the, let's first get to the shortfall. I mean, the um, you know the incumbent has talked about the financial stability of the city, and you know we have a lot of problems that are on the horizon and a lot of things that are growing. You know, the uh, cola. What I'd like to see is that you know a modest cola, nothing that's going to be above you know inflation, because you know if it's if we're keeping it right at inflation, then that allows people to you know keep up to date with their bills, their groceries, um, you know. But w the so there's several unions uh, that are able, like the firefighters in the 848, for example, they have um, the ability to uh, finance their own uh, pension system. You know, that's something that I would like to see us try and work towards with other uh, unions, that, you know, a self-financing system, is if it can work for one, it can work for others. But uh, again, I don't hear a number in there. Do you have any estimate for how much more well, your proposal would, would cost the city pension system? No, the number actually would depend on inflation. So that, that's something that's always fluctuating. And, you know, that's something that, you know, it's really, I mean, as a state representative, I've worked with people who are worried about losing their homes, you know, city employees who are retired and private employees because they, you know, they, you know, they, the cost of living is increasing. You know, sometimes the Social Security is not keeping up with it. Um, they're worried about, you know, whether or not they can pay their property taxes. They're worried about if they can get groceries. They don't know if they can put gas in their car. I mean, these are people that are depending on a pension that they worked for for years and they're being left high and dry at present. Mr. Dumas, you often point with pride to the city's AA bond rating, but the most recent report from S&P did warn of this dark cloud on the horizon, the $68 million for pensions and about $210 million for OPEB, for health care for retirees. Sure. The state has said your current proposal for working off that shortfall on pensions may be too slow. S&P said there's a lack of a sufficient plan to address it. You've had 14 years to develop such a plan. Why not? Sure. So this is what we're doing now. So by, I believe it's approximately 2043, the pension system will be paid in its entirety. Um, so that is the current plan, and we actually allocate over $4 million of the city's budget annually to go towards that pension liability. Most of that pension liability was from, uh, from employees who are drawing off the system now, who there were never monies that were set aside originally. So that's important. Number two, the fact is that part of that pension liability is the fact of what happened in 2008, 2009, which caused the issue from across the country. So our outstanding pension liability for those two things. And so that is through our appropriation process through now through approximately 2043, that, that liability of the existing pension liability would be secured. And for example, employees who are serving today by doing 9 plus 2 percent, so approximately 11 percent of the salary comes out of the weekly paycheck, is actually funding their future retirement benefit. As per OPEB, we actually formed a couple of years ago uh, our separate OPEB fund where we're starting to put some dollars aside. Not much has gone in there so, so far. So there's a couple hundred thousand dollars that have been set aside between On a $210 million dollar liability. Well, no one had ever put any dollars aside. So it's important that A, we establish the fund, B, that we started setting some dollars aside, and that 60-40 split versus the 75-25 health insurance split. That's going to be able to take that liability in the future and cut that down significantly. And our actuarial evaluations will reflect that going forward once we're able to successfully get to that point across the board. Now let's get to the candidate's favorite part of the debate, and this is what we call rapid fire. I'm looking for a one-word answer from each of you. We want to try and cover a lot of ground, but we don't want to litigate each question. So again, one-word answer if we could on each of these. Mr. Ho, we'll start with you. Yes or no, do you support the Massachusetts fair share ballot question that would subject those who make $1 million or more to a 4% surtax? Yes. Yes. Um, Mr. Dumas, uh, should there be term limits for mayor of Attleboro? No. Yes. Mr. And how long should the term limits be? Maximum of eight years, four terms. Four terms. Uh, Mr. Haro, should, uh, oh, give me a letter grade if you could for Governor Charlie Baker. A through F. A through F. Um, depends on the issue. Overall job performance? A B. 
A B. Mr. Dumas? A. Uh, Mr. Dumas, letter grade for President Donald Trump? F. F. We found agreement. And yes or no, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hero, uh, should Attleboro police officers be required to wear body cameras? Conversation for the police chief. With the police chief. You don't have an opinion on that? If I were to give you an immediate opinion without consultation with the police chief, I'd say yes. Okay, and Mr. Dumas? Um, I would also have to have conversation, and that's a bargaining issue, and also with the chief. And you don't have an opinion? No. Okay. All right, Mr. Dumas, we'll stick with you. Um, that's, I grew up in Attleboro, and there's no disputing that downtown has undergone major changes in recent decades, um, both during Judy Robbins' terms and, and yours. Um, critics say, uh, Mr. Hero has spoken to this, that it hasn't been accompanied by enough business growth. There's a lot of residential, there's a lot of uh, changes to the, uh, the streets and, and things like that, but not enough business growth. We, I even read one downtown restaurant owner tell the Sun Chronicle that a tough business climate could force him to close. Uh, what's your response to those who say there hasn't been enough business growth accompanied by these big investments in downtown redevelopment? Sir, sure, we've done a lot in the infrastructure, uh, and that was certainly first to be able to help us along in our redevelopment of the downtown, and including everything we're doing down at the transit or into development district, but it's been crucial that we also focus on increased housing density in the downtown in order to help support businesses that will be there. But another challenge for us, honestly, Ted, is the fact that we have building owners that it's very difficult to be able to work with, that they don't want to put in investment into their commercial space. A perfect one, which George Rose certainly knows about, is right across in the Sun Chronicle. We've been trying to work with the Kanata family for a very long time on that building. Um, which leaves us no choice at this time, um, as I mentioned the other night during the debate, is the fact that we're going to isolate that parcel on South Main Street as one of the parcels for taking, and an additional some for some other property, which no matter how long we've worked and tried to be able to work with that property owner uh, along Park Street and down half down Union Street, has been very, very difficult because they don't want to put in the investment. So if someone's not willing to put in the investment into their private space, even with trying to match with some city community development dollars, uh, there's not much that we can do actually with that. Um, so the thing that we can do is that we can do a new portion of our urban renewal plan, which takes those two areas that I just talked about, makes it right for redevelopment, so the property would be purchased, those buildings would come down, and then it would be a new building with residential Excluding that building space. across from the Sun Chronicle, people have pointed to, for example, the, the first floor, I believe, of the new apartments near the train station uh, don't, don't have, I don't know if they have any retail yet or they're, they're working sure. on that. What do you say people would say, okay, that building's its own issue, but the yeah. other buildings as well? Sure, Renaissance North is what you're referencing, right in the corner of South Main and Wall Street. It's a problematic space for two reasons, actually. One, the way that if you actually look inside the building on the first floor in those two commercial spaces, it's really chopped up and the metal girders go right through the center of it. So it's not even a wide open space, so it's challenging for the person who's going to be renting that space. Secondly, is the fact that there's actually no on-street parking available on South Main Street and around the corner on Wall Street. Um, there isn't space to be able to add parking on South Main for that, but what we can do is that in conjunction with the two new buildings that are going to be constructed right in front of the bus loop across the street there, that we're actually going to do on-street parking on Wall Street on both sides that will help facilitate more opportunity for people to be able to have a business that people can actually park and run in and service. Mr. Hurl, you hear there the, uh, the answer to your complaints about business growth. Uh, what do you, do you, are you satisfied with that? No, I'm not. Um, there are several things that can and should be done differently. Uh, for one, I've identified, as did uh, Ron Churchill, who ran against the mayor back in 2011, uh, that there is no relationship with the Chamber of Commerce. And the Chamber of Commerce has a great pulse on the needs of the business community. Additionally, we also need to hire an economic development director who is a, a professional position dedicated to recruit businesses to come to Attleboro, and that's something we don't have and we should have. Additionally, we uh, can and should work more collaboratively with the ARA because they are able to do things that the city can't do. A lot of these big projects that are going on in the city, uh, the most visible uh, uh, ones are projects that were uh, shepherded by the ARA, not the city administration. All right, your response to that, Mr. Dumas. Sir, I have to say that the fact that um what he doesn't outline, my opponent, is the fact of what would the economic development director do, what resources would that person have. He talks about spending money and creating positions and doesn't talk about where it's going to be coming from, number one. Number two, we do work collaboratively with the ARA. Um, I'm actually the person with my administration that bailed them out of financial bankruptcy in order to save the projects. And how we save the projects is actually bringing forth all state and local partners together state and federal agencies, as well as the Redevelopment Authority and other people who are skilled in, in that area. And that's how we were able to save not only in the Industrial Business Park, which is now creating the largest private sports complex in New England, 
but also being able to save the transit-oriented development project that we're talking about, that area mm -hmm. on Wall Street, the MBTA parking lot, and all the way out to the Olive Street Bridge. Mr. O, you have time. What is, what's your response to that, especially the, what would that, e you've talked about a lot about that economic development director. Yeah. What would that person do? An economic development director would cost sixty to $80,000 a year, depending on qualifications, and that position would pay for itself with the new revenues being brought in by the new businesses. That's number one. Number two, this argument that the mayor bailed out the um, ARA has actually been discredited by the Civil Service Commission as well as the Superior Court in the state. Um, this is, you know, the money was there. In fact, the mayor had said, uh, to, you know, in, in public, uh, you know, that, excuse me, it was, it was a document that went public, that all of the money will be made available to the ARA if they get rid of the um, uh, then executive director, Michael Milanowski, which resulted in a very large uh, lawsuit. So the arguments that he's saying about the uh, you know doom and gloom about the ARA solvency are, have not been supported w with you know the Civil Service Commission, with the Superior Court, with the uh, you know any any of the appeals processes. So it, it's it, it's a, a myth. How about the economic development director, though? What would what would that person do? An economic development director, what they do is they act like a sports recruiter in a sense. They go out, they bring businesses back to Attleboro, they try and sell it. It's a full-time professional position. It's not a position that you have an elected official, uh, you know, specialize in. It's you know, they they come with a skill set, they come with an experience. Usually, they have a master's in public administration. I mean, they they oftentimes um, have you know very long resumes, uh, like a track record of bringing businesses to a community. They are you know they they discuss the strengths and weaknesses. It's a full-time position. It's not the type of thing that a mayor really has the time to do because of these so many other uh, responsibilities. All right, uh, we have just a couple of uh, minutes left and we've covered some heavy topics and a lot of wonky policy issues. Um, so I want to ask you a fun question. Sure. Uh, Mr. Dumas, we'll start with you. If someone were coming from out of town uh, and you had one thing to show them about your city to really showcase Attleboro, one thing, what would it be? Capron Park Zoo. Uh, it's an amazing facility. It's undergone a complete rebirth during my administration. Gene Benchmol is our zoo director, has done an amazing job, uh, not only in the animal collection and the zoo husbandry that takes place, but actually redoing the entire zoo and has just made it such a special place. And actually for all ages, doesn't matter if you're an adult or a kid, um, to be able to go through that facility in its entirety is always a joy and brings a smile to anybody's face. Right. Mr. Haro, you have about 30 seconds. What's the one thing you would showcase? Not only Capron Park Zoo, but Capron Park itself. You know, the, the um, mayor's, uh, I, I agree with what he just said, it's a fantastic zoo, but also the, um, you know, several acres of land that, you know, make up Capron Park. It's, it's beautiful land, it's really well kept, um, you know, th I think that's probably the gem of Attleboro. Look at that, Mr. Mayor, you got some free tourism uh, <laughs> advertising <laughs> here in yeah. WPRI, you didn't even have to pay for it. I want to thank both of our candidates, Mr. Dumas, Mr. Hurl, for joining us on the program. It's never easy to do a debate, but it is important, and don't forget that Election Day is November 7th. If you missed any of this, it's online, WPRI.com. Ted Nisi. I'm Tim White. We will see you next week on Newsmakers for another debate with the mayor of Fall River.